All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And today we have with us Paul Gamble, CEO of Nori. And he's going to talk a little bit about his company, what they're doing for sustainability, as well as blockchain as a whole, and kind of um, what it, that means for s sustainability. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to him, and he'll introduce himself and then get, get right into it. Cool. Thanks, Alex. Hello, uh, everybody. Nice to meet you. Um, my name is Paul Gamble, and I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of Nori. And let me share my screen here. Cool. Can you all see that? So uh, what is Nori? Well, we believe that climate change is uh, a somewhat straightforward problem. There are too many greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And the solution is to pull those gases back out. And I think that a uh, good way of thinking about climate change is what is the total atmospheric carbon concentration of, uh, of CO2 in the air? Today, it's over 415 parts per million. And it would really be best if we could get that back to 300 parts per million, which is where it was prior to the Industrial Re Revolution. So the way to do that is first we start like I'm talking about like humanity as a whole. First, we start by emitting less, which is uh, what's ongoing, you know, conversion to renewables, reducing emissions in manufacturing processes and so on. But then we also have to remove the rest uh, because it turns out that even if we were able to turn off all sources of carbon emissions tomorrow, there's still already far too much out there uh, that has to be removed from the existing atmosphere. So some people look to carbon offsets for this, but not all carbon offsets are created the same. Uh, it's important to know the differences. Uh, so first there are reductions. These are projects that reduce the amount of carbon emissions that are going up into the air. There are avoidances, which are uh, eliminating the source of emissions. And then there are removals, which are actively pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and sequestering it somewhere safely. So removing that carbon dioxide is really the only way that you could negate or reverse carbon emissions that have already happened. The bad news is about 95% of voluntary carbon offsets that are out there are all from reductions and avoidances. There's very little being done on carbon removal itself. And that's what we're trying to change. So we are uh, trying to massively scale up carbon removal because we want to see the world remove over 1.5 trillion tons of CO2 from the atmosphere. And that's, what, and that's where we come in. We are a global transparent marketplace for carbon removal. We are focused on three main things. One is transparency, making it really clear like who is paying for what and what they're buying, uh, making it really simple for people to purchase carbon removals and in focusing only on removal, no reductions or avoidances in our marketplace. So there are several different ways that you can remove carbon from the atmosphere, the, uh, regenerative agriculture, forestry, kelp, and even industrial approaches like direct air capture. But we're focused initially on regenerative agriculture, which is a, a massive, massive opportunity. Uh, American croplands alone could sequester 400 million tons of CO2 annually, and that number gets much bigger when you look at the global croplands potential. So what is regenerative ag? Well, first, it's, it's a series of practices that farmers can do. They can reduce the amount of tilling that they're doing on their land. They can plant cover crops in the winter, uh, keep roots in the ground and implement crop rotations, manage grazing, and so on. And what's happening here is uh, when they are adopting these practices, they're taking very carbon poor soils, like what you see on the left here, and they're increasing and in helping to grow the amount of organic matter that's in the soil. This is like microbes and fungi and worms and nematodes and all sorts of other uh, living creatures in there. And the more organic matter that is in the soil, the more carbon there is because that organic matter is the carbon. This is uh, our the first farmer that we worked with. His name is Trey Hill. He uh, operates a farm in Maryland uh, where they grow corn, soy, and wheat, I believe. And uh, we went live uh, with selling his carbon removals uh, back in the end of 2019. So here is how uh, our marketplace is laid out. Um, there are suppliers. These are people who are removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. There are third-party verifiers who are auditing the data that suppliers are providing to us. 
carbon quantification tools, which are estimating the amount of CO2 that's removed from the atmosphere. And uh, the third party verifiers are checking the data that goes into the carbon quantification tool. And then there are buyers who are individuals, uh, companies, uh, potentially governments who want to pay for the removal of carbon emissions. So the first uh, way this works is uh, suppliers provide operating data to us. So this is farmers telling us data like where their field is located, what kind of crops they're growing, what kind of fertilizer they're applying. And we need that data going back to the year 2000. And then that data has to be verified by an independent third party who are, these are verifiers who are accredited to various high level, uh, various um, ISO and ANSI standards. And they're providing an attestation to Nori and saying, yes, the farmer provided this data and it is accurate uh, to the best of our knowledge that they actually did grow these crops on this particular field in this year and that kind of thing. So they're, they're checking, was the input data correct? Uh, does the farmer have the legal right to sell this carbon? Uh, and are we making sure that they're not double counting this and selling this elsewhere as well? Then we send that data to our carbon quantification tool, which uh, is a, um, a platform called Soil Metrics. They are relying on soil sample testing that's happening around the country and then data models layer on, layered on top of it. And we're able to uh, determine what is the amount of carbon that's going in the ground relative to what would have happened if they just continued with conventional practices. And then once all that's done, we issue what we call NRTs or Nori Carbon Removal Tons to the suppliers, which they can then sell. And then the uh, buyers purchase uh, the NRTs through Nori. So we, we have like a project for sale right now that's a uh, farm is in Iowa. He's selling his NRTs at $15 per ton. And there are links to all of this on our website at nori.com. Um, what happens when farmers are issued NRTs, they're signing a contract with us that says they're going to maintain the practices to keep the carbon in the ground uh, for, well, they're at least going to maintain the carbon stocks in the ground for a minimum of 10 years. And they're going to provide data uh, to us every year, and then they have to re-verify that data at least every three years. And we also are able to uh, make a guarantee to buyers. So we insure this, uh, and this is where cryptocurrency comes in. Um, so we have an insurance reserve that we're able to draw upon to make sure that if there is some sort of carbon loss, we can buy new NRTs on behalf of the original buyer. In the future, we will uh, build uh, our API where it'll be more automatic. So in, in, imagine carbon removal built into every sort of application that you use. Maybe you take an Uber ride and at the end of the ride, um, uh, a sponsor plays an ad and then they pay for removing the carbon from the trip that you just took. So automatic payments at checkout. Um, uh, I'll end here. This is really just kind of a comparison between um, us and different uh, legacy carbon offset markets. Um, so that's that's kind of Nori's marketplace uh, in a nutshell. Um, I didn't touch on any of the blockchain components of this yet, but I'll pause there and see if there are any questions. Um, so I was I was going to ask. So um, when they do like when they sell the carbon and then they remove it, what do they, what do they do with the, like the soil that they purchased? The buyers? Yeah. So the buyers are purchasing the NRTs, which are digital representations of the carbon that, so they're not doing anything like on the land directly, but they do own those NRTs forever. Okay. I have another question kind of similar. So first of all, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. Sorry. Sometimes I have trouble with these. So um, when you have a no-till system, a lot of the carbon in the plants, like the plants sequester CO2, right? And then store that carbon in the tissues, which is then probably left on the field to, to decay and be worked into the soil, correct? Not exactly, no. So okay. um, what this is measuring is the amount of organic matter that's in the soil. So what happens is you plant the crop through photosynthesis, they're pulling CO2 out, but then they're converting that uh, into sugars and starches, nutrients that they deposit into the soils via their root systems. 
And then that feeds organic matter, microbes and fungi, which are in turn breaking down minerals that they're providing back to the root systems. So what's being measured here is not the above ground biomass, but in fact, the amount of carbon from the organic matter that's in the soil. So the two sources of organic matter in the soil would be root exudate, which you just mentioned. So like the plants are, are taking like basically sugar water and feeding yeah. the microbes in the soil. But then yeah. there's also organic matter coming from like leaf litter or corn stalks or, or whatever else that's also yeah. going into the soil. Uh, sure, but that's not really included because as you said, it can decay and then that would re-release the emissions back up into the sure. atmosphere. So that's not what's being measured. Okay, so I'm just trying to get, I'm trying to understand exactly where that cutoff is. So if, if the plant is providing carbon to the microbes in the soil, they're eating that carbon and then respiring. And so when they're, when they're eating the like glucose, they break it down into CO2 and stored carbon. So they're still releasing CO2. So what I'm yeah, trying so to get at is like, what mass are you measuring to get these numbers? It's, we're measuring the amount of carbon in the soil relative to what would have happened if you had continued with conventional practices. So like one way you could do this is with soil sample testing where you're doing mass spectrometry on like a sample of the soil and you're measuring the amount of carbon there. The challenge there is if you're just doing that on a field by field basis, you're not necessarily measuring relative to what would have happened. And so you're including things like weather changes and stuff. So that platform that we use, uh, that we partner with called Soil Metrics, they're built off of a, um, a platform that's called Comet Farm, which is has been funded by USDA for a long time. And it's really the federal government's greenhouse gas accounting tool. And what they're doing is they're, they're they're estimating the amount of carbon that you're putting in the ground relative to a uh, conventional field. So the, like the proper way to do soil sample testing is you would have a, an experimental field that's doing the new regen practices. Then you'd have a control field right next to it that you're doing conventional practices on. And then you measure soil samples on both of them. And the amount of carbon stored is the difference between the two. It's not the difference over time on one field. So this Comet Farm platform and soil metrics, they're basically simulating that and, and helping us to determine the amount of carbon there. Thank you. What other questions are there? Um, I don't think I see any other questions coming in. If anyone has a question, just feel free to like un unmute yourself or like put in the chat or whatever. So, cool. So one thing I didn't talk about really is the blockchain component, and where this comes in is the the history of carbon markets is that back in 1997, when the Kyoto Protocol was passed, um, the the UN set up what were basically frameworks for. Uh, building out carbon markets. And the idea was that these would be traded between nation states, not necessarily between like companies and individuals. And what they did was they, they intended uh, for developed countries to be paying developing countries uh, for carbon uh, in their country. So think of like uh, a buyer in Canada or the United States or Europe um, purchasing carbon credits from like a forestry project in Brazil. That was the intention. But with Paris in 2015, that all changed where, where now every country has their own emissions reductions targets. And it is still the case today that literally every carbon credit that has ever been sold across international borders has been counted twice. So if a project happens in Brazil and then they sell that to a buyer somewhere in Europe, the, say France, both Brazil and France will count that as an emissions reduction. So they're, they're being double counted. That's a, a form of uh, a double counting that is very simply solved with double entry bookkeeping, which is really what blockchain can help provide here. So when NRTs sell to buyers in our market, they're actually immediately retired, meaning they cannot be resold and the buyer has to specify in what jurisdiction they're retiring that NRT. So that's a very particular use case. We also use um, the, the way that this works right, uh, well, will work later this year is when we, when we finally launch our token, 
one Nori token will always be able to purchase one NRT. And there will be a finite number of Nori tokens that circulate around the economy. Um, so they're not burned. They're just, uh, think of it like a reusable gift card. And uh, the price of that Nori token will fluctuate based on supply and demand. So the idea is as demand for NRTs increases, so too will demand for the Nori token. And since there's a finite supply of the Nori tokens, uh, that should then uh, potentially increase the price of the Nori token, which creates a greater incentive for suppliers to enter the market, which is what we're trying to do. We're trying to create better incentives for people to remove carbon from the air. So that's where the blockchain and crypto portions come into play. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's very, very interesting. I was like wondering about the um, like the double spend and blockchain is definitely a unique solution to that. Um, I was kind of on another note, more of a hot topic. I don't know if you've um, if you have any opinion on this, but the difference between the energy consumption of um, proof of work and proof of stake protocols and um, that that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, I mean, proof of work has a lot of value to it. And I, I think that the solution to the problem here, the problem being too many carbon emissions coming from operating a proof of work network is to just remove the emissions associated with it. So if you go to my Twitter account, which is just at Paul Gamble, um, my pinned tweet right now is some cal rough calculations that we did on what it would cost to remove the emissions associated with uh, one year's worth of operating both Bitcoin and Ethereum. And it's something on the order of like $700 million if the supply were there, the, the supply is not available. But if there were enough supply, it would only cost $700 million to remove the emissions from all of Bitcoin and Ethereum, which is really not that expensive considering like the total market caps of these. It would be only 0.1% of the market cap uh, of Bitcoin and Ethereum. So the, I, I think that it's a sort of false choice that we're presented with these days as people are growing more concerned about the energy consumption of different uh, blockchain networks. Just remove the emissions, like they're, they're providing value. I think that Ethereum moving to proof of stake is a good thing, um, but in the meantime, just remove the emissions. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I was listening to a podcast um, the other day that made some very similar points of how, you know, like these proof of work um, networks are basically powering a financial system. And it seems rather silly to complain about that when it's somewhat of a necessity to have these financial systems in play. But yeah, obviously it's just um, proof of stake and proof of work are just um, hot topics nowadays. And it's just cool to see everyone's um, opinions. Um, so like another question I have is, where do you see the future of uh, blockchain in these um, sustainable companies? How do you think blockchain can play a role in um, helping with climate change? I know your company does a very good job and is on the forefront of that. But do you think other companies are going to adopt it? Um, how, they can, how can they adopt it and like what the future will look like? Will other companies adopt blockchain or other sustainability companies? Uh, will other, will other um, sustainability companies use blockchain technology for um, climate change initiatives or maybe like uh, countries and nations? If there's some, if you see some way that blockchains can be implemented into that. Um, I don't think there's, I don't have any like novel suggestions on this. I, it's like blockchain is a good useful like ledger of account. And so where there are challenges uh, around ledgers, like it's useful for that. Um, I don't think blockchain is the solution to every problem. Um, and I, I think where it's really useful here is in preventing double counting and that sort of thing. Does, does anyone in the chat have any questions here? Okay. I don't see any. Okay. Well, so 
another question I have for you is, um, do you, do you think when it comes to, do you think the current opinion on climate change is going to, in the, do you think in the future more people will be um, wanting to do carbon removal and, um, you know, implement that into their vision? Um, because I before, before I, I heard of Nori, I've, I've not heard of a company doing carbon removal. Do you think this is something that will kick off um, in the future? Oh yeah, this is an enormous market. There are lots of companies that have been entering the carbon removal space and there's been a lot of investment funding into startups that are working on carbon removal. I think this all changed in 2018 when the last IPCC report came out acknowledging that there is going to be a need for removing carbon from the atmosphere in order to um, maintain the particular targets that the UN has. So um, yes, there are lots of companies developing lots of different technologies and tools uh, for carbon removal, uh, for measuring uh, carbon uh, removed and that sort of thing. If, if you could, um, if you could give like uh, a perspective, someone advice that wants to get into the space, what kind of advice would, would you give them? Um, I would start by embedding yourself in different communities that are focused on uh, like climate tech and climate check solutions, carbon removal solutions. Um, so there, like we have a great podcast that we publish every week called Reversing Climate Change. So I would check that out. Uh, there are things like My Climate Journey from Jason Jacobs, which is a whole community around it. There's the climateaction.tech uh, Slack community, which is another um, great big uh, organization. So I would just embed yourself into this space and learn more about what other people are doing um, because there, there's a lot more happening than you probably think there is. Great. Um, now, if you, if you could pick, um, what would you say is the biggest challenge to climate change initiatives today? Biggest challenge of climate change initiatives today, um, scalability. There's plenty of money pouring in to fund this stuff. There's plenty of interest from buyers. The challenge is around scaling operationally, both for Nori and for others in the space. Mm -hmm. uh, also, if you, do you have any um, like cool, it doesn't have to be an, um, like environmental related, but any cool um, coins or protocols or projects that you've seen out there that you maybe wanted to, you know, share something like that? Um, I, you know, one thing that we're seeing a lot recently is we're having, um, we're getting a lot of inbound requests from NFT creators who want to uh, associate carbon removals with their NFTs. So I think that's that's a good and interesting trend that's happening. Um, I'm generally interested in the proof of stake transition Ethereum is making. I'm generally interested in ways that we can um, sort of partner and work with other, whether they're layer one or other dApps or something like that and how we can incorporate carbon removal into that. Um, yeah, I think that's what I've been paying most attention to recently. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, it's definitely interesting how the whole um, market is moving right now. It's, um, it's, I mean, it's good to see all these, um, these apps and all these coins and the market's just um, doing very well right now, which is good, but ho hopefully it lasts for a while. Um, so th does anyone else in the chat have any questions? I think we're gonna wrap it up here. Um, I don't, know if you, I don't know if you could see the chat, Paul, but there's a question in there. Is there a gap between supply and demand for offsets through Nori and how large is that gap? Um, 
there is far, 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 far more demand out there than there is supply available. And I mean that like broadly across the entire market. The total number of carbon credits ever created is somewhere between four and six billion tons. And we globally emit around 40 to 50 billion tons of CO2 equivalent every year. So like over the last 20 plus years, the total number of carbon credits ever created is only 10% of one year's worth of annual emissions. Um, so it's, uh, I, I very much believe this is a supply constrained market, not a demand constrained market. Okay. So if there's no more questions, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Um, okay. Yeah. So, well, Paul, thank you again for coming. Um, you did a, uh, I'm sure everyone appreciated um, you being here with us. Uh, lots of good questions. Um, and I will also be posting this on YouTube if you want to rewatch it again. Um, go, 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 I'll, I'll post a link on LinkedIn and you'll be able to see it there. Um, but yeah, thanks again to Paul for coming and speaking with us today. Um, it, was, it was a pleasure. And thank you, everyone else, for coming. Well, cool. thank you for having me.